Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I have with me another very special guest who is going to talk about a very important but a contentious uh, subject. Um, so how are you doing, Melvin? I'm doing very well today. Um, I'm so honored to be a guest here, and I'm looking yeah. forward to the conversation we're going to be having. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it uh, as well. Uh, it is very exciting to be talking about someone who wants to uh, openly discuss something that has been lost to the centuries since the uh, Renaissance or uh, even uh, or even the 19th century, although the 21st century was a little murky with all the pseudo New Age religions that were uh, modeled, modeled up inside of the sciences. The sciences like uh, like alchemy, like um, you know, uh, palmistry, uh, uh, reading uh, reading palms, uh, astrology, looking at the stars, they are all at some point a, a kind of science. It, they are ways to look at the world and to uh, measure and to uh, describe the world. So, can you tell me a little bit? first about what you do before we get into the meat of the subject. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to say it this way. So my day job, I am a digital artist where uh, my wife and I own a company where we do computer animation, we do graphic design videos and things of that nature. Uh, and my second job is uh, as a spiritual teacher, I don't really get paid for this one. It's more about, <laughs> yeah. you know, what my what I believe my life purpose is, uh, I've always had a fascination with, you know, the universe and different religions and, and things dealing with science and spirituality. And I've always just kind of had a, a not only a fascination, but an understanding uh, and, and, a, and an ability to be able to see, you know, some very good information that just kind of makes you think about things. So um I uh, started my own personal channel called newyou.com where I talk about uh, putting on the new you as an individual, you know, where we talk about transformation and uh, when we look at our lives wanting to make improvements and, you know, every, every new year, at least in America, we have what we call New Year's resolution. So that's where people think about the changes that they want to make in their life. And it usually doesn't last for maybe two or three weeks before they stop, you know, so... <laughs> Um, what I talk about is more from a spiritual perspective because I believe that we are spiritual beings and that in order to make real lasting change, you have to understand that concept and work with who you are as a spirit. And I think that's where real transformation takes place. So as a spiritual teacher, I get into topics like that where I discuss how we're spiritual beings in the universe and how to make those connections so that we can improve our daily lives and, and improve the areas around us as human beings. Yeah, so this is going to be very exciting, I think. Yeah. Um, I think we should start with something that is a little uh, offbeat, shall we say, to talk about the age itself. Not, okay. not to have a broad discussion about the age, but just a little uh, appetizer, shall we say, hors d'oeuvre. Uh, <laughs> and just to talk about the, the age, because a lot of cultures and religions and mystical uh, religions, uh, mystery cults, which not a lot of people know about, but they were surrounded around the worship of one thing, trying to unify all the different uh, sort of aspects of nature into one uh, thing maybe an object, uh, sometimes it was a place, or even a human being who was worshipped as a, as a I don't want to say that, that word, as, as a living God, because I don't believe that anyone deserves to be worshipped as a living God, but everyone should worship themselves as a living God. So what do you think about the age? Because the Hinduism and Buddhism talk about the the different ages, the four ages, and we are living in the, the Kali Yuga, which is the age of destruction. So what do you think about that? What really resonates with me is um, 
I, I like to talk a lot about the Bible because that's kind of my background. And I know people are afraid of that book. You know, <laughs> some people look at it and they go, you know, this book condemns yeah, everything I have good. It, and, I have it with me at all times. Yeah. yeah so I also like to bookmark. At, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. My, my Bible is all written up and I have highlighter notes and everything. But um, I, I really, what really resonates with me is when Jesus talked about what, what most people will say is the end of the world uh, in the Bible, but if you look that word up, he's talking about the age. You know, that's what it's translated, the age and the time that we're in. And I like to think that when I look at the stories of Jesus, you can take it one or two ways. One, you can look at it that it was literal, but you can also look at it from a more metaphoric standpoint. For example, when Jesus talked about the end of the age, and he was talking to his disciples, he told them to go to a room and they would see a man carrying a pitcher of water, right? And during the customs of that day and time, men did not carry water. It was a responsibility of the women. And so what do we have as a symbol in today's, you know, knowledge of a man carrying water? It's Aquarius, right? So uh, I believe he was talking about how, that the world would be moving from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. Because when you look at all the symbolisms that we have today, uh, even in religious circles that deal with Jesus, they're very Pisces, uh, Pisces type symbolism. You know, even the fish that yeah, yeah, you yeah, see yeah. that represents Jesus. Yeah, and, when Ixos, we went, Ixos, yeah. Jesus. and when you look, yeah, and when you look at his ministry, he was a fisherman. And so when you look at all the different references to fish, and even when you look at the symbolisms in the Catholic Church today, they all stem from symbols that deal with Pisces. And so when Jesus was talking about the end of the age, I believe he was talking about moving into the age of Aquarius that I believe we are currently in or, or moving into very soon, where everything is going to move from more of a... Uh, connection to the universe and receiving knowledge in that way rather than religion and superstition if that makes sense and so on the one hand i think if you look at any type of uh spiritual teachings and spiritual writings they all kind of give a hint as to the same types of things they may say it all a little bit differently but we all know when we look at the world the world has changed a lot you know <laughs> so uh some things have have always been the same but i think with the internet and with knowledge connecting us all, making the world a little bit smaller, that the world has changed to the point to where, you know, things that may have taken years to, to figure out and find out, we have at the click of a button. And, and with that, I think we have to take a responsibility to look at how we conduct ourselves in the world because everyone has access to all kinds of knowledge, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 it makes perfect sense because you know, the knowledge was at the hand of the priesthood, the class, of course, the priesthood, yeah. I'll uh, try to correct my pronunciation a little bit. Um, so <laughs> people have, there used to be a universal language. It was uh, English. Before that, it was uh, Latin and Greek. And before that, it was whatever language they spoke at the Tower of Babel. Um, it was a universal language. Um, before that, there was uh, something that I don't want to get into, uh, you know, a little bit of a mysterical or superstitious uh, kind of beliefs, but maybe the language of the angels, which also the Jewish tradition believes in. Uh, in the Kabbalah and mysticism, the real Kabbalah, not the Madonna, you know, uh, uh, la uh, Madonna Kabbalah, but the real uh, Kabbalah. So what do you think about trying to interpret the world through the new medium of the internet? Because now knowledge is everywhere and people seem to be less and less knowledgeable about themselves and the society as a whole. So what do you think about that? I think that we have to, as a species, 
come to understand that we are part of the universe. And, 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 we, and the reason why I bring that up is when you look at nature, everything in nature automatically just kind of has an awareness of the environment that it's in and it's perfectly synced to the environment, right? You know, even the seasons that we deal with, when you look at trees, you know, trees go through all the four seasons and they don't have to be told to do that. They are just in sync with nature and in sync with the universe. Human beings are the only ones that don't, do, don't you know, follow the laws of nature inherently. And I think part of that is because of knowledge. I think not, not that knowledge is a bad thing, but I think more we don't understand the importance of, of, of synchronicity. We don't understand the importance of getting to the flow and the rhythm of life. And I think knowledge is a part of that because on the one hand, you can take, you know, when Einstein dealt with looking at something invisible like the atom, and you can look at the power that is within something invisible and look at ways to which you can benefit the world from that understanding and from that knowledge. But then on the flip side, someone can take that knowledge and create a bomb to destroy life. So I think when we deal with knowledge and when we deal with, you know, the internet and, and having knowledge at our fingertips, we have to understand who we are as individuals and how we're going to take that knowledge and bring something good to the world. And, and look at ways in which we can modify human behavior in a sense to, to bring, you know, light to the world and do good things. You know, for example, electricity, I've heard this said many times, you can take electricity and light your house or you can kill the person with the same electricity. You know, so it's what we do with knowledge that makes all the difference in the world. And I think that having access to knowledge is great, but being able to incorporate that knowledge and, and convert that knowledge into what I like to call wisdom, which is the ability to use knowledge for good, is where we should be focusing. And, and a lot of people are so distracted now with life and with survival and just trying to figure out how to outdo the next person, you know, that they don't focus on what I think is most important. And that's about love and about life and about, you know, being able to take that knowledge and do good in the world. Yeah, so so let's talk about doing uh, good in the world. And I think the, it comes in different forms and a lot of people have different aspects and concepts of what the good actually constitutes. So what do you think about the, the concept of the good in, in the past that was if more focused on trying to appease God, trying to, uh, you know, uh, search the natural world to explore the creation that God had made for us. So how do we try to uh, ignite the human, uh, shall we say, um, I don't know, inquisitiveness? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how you put that. Um, I, I think that when we, when we look at, at what it means to do good in the world, I think it boils down to one thing. And, and, uh, you were talking about a universal language earlier. I truly believe the universal language is love. And when we think about what love is, it's not, you know, about goosebump feelings and kisses and hugs. That's, that's all a part of it. But I think love boils down to compassion and empathy. And in order to really explore what that means, you have to consider um, when you deal with another human being, how do you see that person? Do you find a way to look at them as someone who, no matter what they're dealing with, no matter what religious background they may come from that's different than yours or whatever their race may be that's different than yours, consider them as a human being first with the same needs that you have, you know? Most of the time nowadays, we don't even talk to people. We, we get in our little clusters of friends. Well, now we're in the middle of a pandemic where uh, human interaction is, is, you know, dangerous at, to, to a degree, depending on how, you know, you handle yourself and all that with COVID going on. And I'm no, by no means an expert on COVID, but just, just to bring up how before COVID occurred, think of it this way. People were so busy doing a lot of different things, but not 
spreading love to, to others, you know, and we can look at, you know, from a moralistic standpoint, that's kind of what we used to judge as being good in the world. You know, if you follow these commandments, then you're good. Or if you do what the church says, then that makes you a good person. But even when you look at the teachings of, you know, the Bible and other religious texts, it boils down to loving another human being as you love yourself. And when you are able to do that, I think that you step outside of yourself and you consider other people before you and you consider their needs and you look at life more from an attitude of servitude versus selfishness, you know, where everything is about you as an individual and it has to be this way and you have to do this in order for me to be happy. But I think when you look at how to do good in the world, when you start considering other people and you consider the needs of others and how you can be a facilitator of ensuring that others are taken care of, I think that's what it's all about. Yeah, um, I think uh, I think so too. But uh, you know, there are different uh, categories of love and different mm -hmm. people to analyze what that means. So um, I think in the past, because you mentioned you were an artist, in the past, the connection between the between the state and the art was uh, tight. You know. Yeah. The state was uh, legislating art, commissioning art to be a sort of propaganda, essentially. But also that propaganda was very artful, shall we say. It was mystical. The, the paint, the, the kind of material, everything had some, something to say. Everything had a motive, a purpose. Now art seems to be, you know, kind of anti-establishment, rebellious, uh, avant-garde. Um, so do you think the, the purpose of art in uh, spreading uh, love or the, the, the deep concepts of human, of the, of the human, humanity in all of us, uh, in our souls that comes from the, the cosmic concepts do you think that that depiction in art has changed or is it or has it just shifted that is a very good question i think that <laughs> that the um that that is shifted a little bit um and i think you know when you consider the renaissance for example we we know that you know, a lot of art came out during that time, but what also was going on during that time was suppression. You know, we had, uh, as you were saying, propaganda and things of that nature that were being put forth. Artists were being commissioned to push it, as you you said. And I think nowadays, when, when we look at the conflict that's happening in the world, you have artists that kind of use art as their voice, you know, where some people are comfortable getting on the stage and speaking out about certain injustices, other people, you know, they, they fight wars, you know, with money and things of that nature. Yes. But I, th I think artists have, a, have, a, have an inherent understanding of how to um, connect with the universe to deliver a message in a sense, because the subconscious mind receives symbols. It speaks the language of symbols. And so artists are able to take information that are that is abstract or things that we we don't even have a concept of that's just out here in the ethers, right? And the artist has a way of just connecting to that and giving it life and giving it a face. And so when we deal with, you know, <laughs> things that are going on in the world that may be bad, an artist has a way of maybe just doing one piece of work, whether it's a sculpture or whether it's a painting but there's some symbology in it that a person will see and it resonates with them and it makes them think. And, and I, I believe that that's one of the, the most important things about art is not necessarily, you know, it, it's interpreted differently by different people where someone may look at a painting and go, wow, that's a cool looking picture, you know, <laughs> where another person looks at it and it speaks volumes to them. It inspires them. It opens up something in their minds to make them look at the world in a different way. And so I believe that art has shifted because the culture in which we live, I think, is what determines the quality and kind of art that comes out, whether it's censored or, you know, whether we have free reign to 
design and do whatever we want to do. But at the end of the day, I think the more connected a person is to to themselves and to what's happening in the world, that their art will speak one way or the other. Yeah, uh, art is in the eye of the beholder. And uh, I believe that and I uh, disown that uh, statement at the same time. <laughs> let me explain, because when I look at, uh, let's, let's say there is a kind of a genre that was developed by a, an artist named Michelangelo de Caravaggio, ah. of course. It was called Bodegonas. Bodegonas is a kind of, shall we say, uh, maybe uh, um, a, a tavern, uh, a tavern or a sort, a kind of a tavern, Bodegona. Uh, it, it was translated into bodega or stuff like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when I look at a, at a painting of Caravaggio and I see the I see the hanged Jesus on the cross and I say wow he died for our sins <laughs> I know <laughs> I know the guy yeah I see I see him uh, right there or if I see Paul of Tarsus dropping down from his horse on the way to Damascus I say yes I see the light but <laughs> so in that sense, art is not in the eye of the beholder, I think, or maybe it's just my uh, personal opinion. So do you think that similar to the past, that we are trying to appease the gods within ourselves, shall we say, by all those tributions, shall we say? or uh, evocations to the God? I, I think that nowadays that's changed a little bit, absolutely in the past, because that was the level of knowledge that we had. You know, it, it was, you know, this God, whether the God lived in a volcano that we needed to make sacrifices to, you know, or whether the God lived in the forest that we needed to do different things to, or, or to appease in some kind of way, or in the jungle, you know, every culture and every tribe has had what they, you know, refer to as their connection to God and what, what that looks like and what that means to them. And oftentimes artists were, you know, commissioned or not, but, but they gave depictions of what this God looked like or, or what, what it means to be in service to this God or this entity. And that, in a sense, kind of fear in the hearts of man. Uh, you know, like, like you talk about uh, you just mentioned Jesus on the cross, you know, and, and things of that nature. When you look at Christianity and how Christianity has has spread throughout the world, we all have a, if I asked anyone, what does Jesus look like? It's going to be based more than likely on a painting that someone's seen somewhere. And um, I think that nowadays people are more open-minded uh, because I think religion has failed a lot of people. I believe that they have come into situations in life now where when you look at the quality of life nowadays, it's gotten so, um, what's the word I should use? It's gotten so fragmented that in a lot of ways, you know, people have to deal with, well, did God deliver me from this particular situation? Or did God speak to me when I needed an answer in this situation? Or, or what's happening in my life right now when I need answers? And when people are looking at life from that, that point of view, I think that, you know, where they stand with God and such now, even as an artist, it's, it's more of a, an interpretive thing based on more relative. That's the word I was looking for, where it's more relative to the individual, you know, because I can say in my life where I've had experiences that I would say were from God, but then someone else may say, well, you know, the, those were just circumstantial. You know, or you may have had experiences where it may be something altogether different. And so I think that as artists, it's more about how you're connected into the world now. And I think that, that God per se doesn't necessarily influence art the way that, you know, God and spirituality used to in the past, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, th I think, I think the, I think the way in which we connect with each other and how we, have learned about how the world actually works and how the universe works from science. 
I think it's kind of removed a lot of the superstition and the yeah, the yeah, um, yeah, of ideologies of religion that would keep us superstitious rather than keep us looking into a very living universe, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, since the time of the Renaissance, people like Machiavelli were trying to wipe out religion. Um, not, not in a mean sense or, or something like this. It's, it's just people need to, they fought, he fought, and then Neoplatonists, shall we say, thought that you should wipe out anything that is not reasonable, that it doesn't have to do with logic. And uh, shall we say, the oratory that is, uh, the, the, that is being spewed by the Catholic Church is not necessarily true. And it's not uh, congruent with the scientific method. And the, and the research into science. So I want to move ahead from this topic okay. and talk about, yeah, with your permission, <laughs> of course. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the power of language because we are path-seeking creatures, animals. Uh, we should say a species to be completely neutral not to use a, you know, charged up words, um, but we are creature, we are a path seeking creatures, uh, species. And one of the ways that we uh, try to express ourselves to communicate is through language and words and through stories. So uh, it comes to my point when I want to talk about my, my channel to talk about the name, the Thoth the Scribe, the, the guy who is a, kind of a, uh, I don't know, maybe a lawyer to the gods, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's also a magician, uh, is uh, many things. So can you talk not, not specifically about a Thoth the Scribe, but if you want to mention him, it's okay. But you talk about story making and myth making that is so powerful and is ingrained in the human psyche for generations. Yeah. So can you talk about things that impact our psyche in that way by myth making? Absolutely. So I believe that, you know, when we deal with, with the human species, we have, and especially in terms of dealing with language, when you consider what language is, it's really how we fundamentally communicate to each other. But language is much deeper than the words that we use because when you think about when you speak a word, what typically happens is if, if I was to ask you to think about the color blue, or if I said something is blue, when you hear me say that, it triggers an image in your mind. It, it, it paints a picture within your imagination. And that's kind of how we connect because um, otherwise, if we didn't have that, that middle ground in order to connect to one another, if I said, hey, stop at this stop sign and you don't know what that means, you can get into an accident. You know what I'm saying? So when we deal with language and when we deal with myth, I think that myth, was primarily used to explain universal concepts to us. And I'm gonna use a big word that I've learned is a lot of things when we deal with um, myth is an anthropomorphized yes. version of, of, of a universal principle. <clears throat> yes. You know, so when we look at how, um, and I'm trying to, to not get into religion too much, but religion is full of myth and full of things. You know, for, for example, uh, in the Hindu belief, there is a God called Ganesha. And Ganesha symbolizes, when, when you look at an image of Ganesha, Ganesha looks like he's half man, half elephant. And there are very different depictions of Ganesha, or I, I could say the same thing about Buddha. I can say the same thing about any kind of a story. Um, but within those myths and within those stories, they are sending a higher message. They are sending a message that oftentimes people don't get because they don't understand the symbology and they don't understand the language that's being used to communicate a truth. 
you know, for example, there's, I, I love reading about the parables that Jesus taught. And, and one in particular was about a sower. And, you know, when I say sower, I'm not talking about a person who makes clothes or seamstress. I'm talking about a farmer. And in this story, he tells, he tells about a farmer went out to sow a seed and some of his seed fell by the wayside. Some of the seed fell among thorns. Some of the seed, you know, fell into good ground and produced a crop, right? So in that story, he broke that story down later. And what I believe he was talking about was how we can manifest things in our lives by what we understand and by what we believe. And in that example alone, there's so many ways in which, you know, if you understand the symbols and if you understand what it means, then you can get the higher message. Let's go to Greece when we talk about Zeus and when we talk about, you know, Aries and we talk about Jupiter and all of those different gods, they all convey some form of a connection with humanity to the divine. But oftentimes people got caught up in the symbolisms and they built temples and they did all these various things and they didn't get the higher message, you know, and, and that's kind of the same today where, you know, we'll look at well, maybe we should take the Ten Commandments down out of this building or out of that building, but we don't get the message of the Ten Commandments and we make it more about the story of the Ten Commandments rather than, you know, it, it's about how I'm relating to another human and how I'm relating to the world, if, if that makes sense. So I think that mythology is a great tool that was used, but everyone does not have the uh, capacity in a sense, to understand it, and they have to be taught the deeper meaning of the myth so that they can move beyond the symbols, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, the metaphor comes to life. It touches upon a little bit about poetry. The power of poetry was very poignant in ancient times and then the Renaissance. Now it has lost its meaning in a lot of way, but it gained some ground in the form of the slam poetry, but it's not exactly what you and I know as poetry. It's not the divine comedy. It's not Paradise Lost. It's something <laughs> else. It, uh, it is a uh, very, uh, it picks my interest. So what do you think about about power of, uh, of poetry and in the trying to convey a message, a mystical message, because I see, I see poetry as any other sort of art. It has the power to express, to convey a message. Uh, it's not scientific. It has a lot of uh, scientific terms and uses and uh, different concepts that are built inside the language that are scientific in nature and philosophical, but they tend to be more, you know, uh, nostalgized, shall we say, dramatized. So what do you think about the power in poetry and of the age? I believe that poetry is extremely powerful. And the reason why I, I believe so is because I understand the nature and power of words and how words affect us as individuals. I personally believe through, you know, just my studies and my own personal experience that words are, are so powerful because what we hear alters who we are. What we hear fundamentally, if we hear it enough, will change what we believe. And we all know that what we do is based off what we believe. So a good poet can write things and express themselves in such a way that it resonates with you as a human being. You know, they, they, they can express a truth or express a frustration. You know, they, they, can, they can say something in such a way that when you hear those words or if you read those words, you take that information on the inside of you and it does something like a seed. It gets planted into your spirit. It gets planted into your, your, the core of who you are. And, you know, let, when, when we talk about poetry, I think, you know, we can bring up propaganda, you know, in a sense to where yeah, it's yeah. written, it's, it's written words in a lot of way, but it's written with the intent to influence, you know, it's, it's written 
uh, to convey a message in order to get you to do something else or, or to change or modify the behaviors of the collective to move everyone in a particular direction. Because those who typically are in the know on that level understand as a species, we are and we do fundamentally what we believe in within our hearts. You know, so if we hear something long enough, if you think about commercials, you know, I'm in that industry where I produce commercials. It's, it's essentially a message to get someone to buy a particular product. And oftentimes the words that are utilized, they may sound soft, but they are used to promote fear. For example, if you don't get this particular life insurance policy, look at what's going to happen to your family, you know, if you should expire. Or if you drink this particular beverage, you can lose X amount of weight, you know. So it, it, it does something to the mind when you hear a particular word, uh, whether it's, it's written or it's spoken, it affects your psychology. And that is the intent of a lot of what we see out in the world when we hear music, when we, you know, scientists have discovered through the art of, uh, I believe it's called, uh, oh gosh, I'm gonna mess the word up, I don't remember it, but there's a science where, I'm sure you've seen this, where they'll take granules of sand and put it on a metal plate. Yeah. And yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll hit, they'll hit different tones and, the, and based on what the tone is, the sand will make a different pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've seen it. Yeah. yeah, different so artists we, use uh, those. Okay. Yeah, and, and so what they found out though is that as, as the makeup of our body responds to sound vibration, just like those granules of sand, it literally changes who we are at the fundamental level of our atoms, you know, so, yeah. uh, bringing it back full circle, a person who's a good poet, you know, whether they're trying to express a good emotion or getting you to think about something or just something that they're dealing with, they're able to take and utilize the beauty of language and words to convey a message that it'll bypass your physical mind sometimes and go straight to your heart and change and alter your behavior, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> so that, that's yeah. why I think it's written things are so powerful because you know, those of us who, who are in the know and who study things understand that words are very influential. And when you even look at spelling and spell work, it's words. Yeah, I want to thank you so much for this interesting and exciting and wonderful conversation. I hope we have uh, many more in the future about different subjects and we can be more specific, I think. It's been awesome. It's been a lot of fun and uh, thought provoking for sure. You know, I think that um, more of us should talk about these things because you know that there's there's another person in the world who's at least been curious, you know, and, and sometimes the, the environments don't allow for people to have these kind of conversations, which, you know, a good thing about knowledge and about the internet is now I can go to a YouTube channel and if I have a curiosity about this kind of a topic, someone's done a video. You know, so uh, I think it's great. And, and I definitely look forward to having more discussions like this for sure. Yeah, this has been great. Thank you so much, Melvin. Bye. All right, have a good one. Yeah, and thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.